The Ponzi Scheme Nowadays, we often hear these words about money scams or fraud. Do you know how this word Ponzi Scheme came in existence? Please subscribe, like and share our videos for more informatics topic. Once upon a time, there was a man named Charles Ponzi, born in Italy in 1882. Ponzi's family had been rich in the past, but due to hard times, they fell on difficult times. Hoping for a better future, Ponzi's family encouraged him to immigrate to the United States. Ponzi arrived in Boston in 1903 with only $2.50 in his pocket, having gambled away the rest of his savings during the voyage. Despite his humble beginnings, Ponzi was a quick learner and a sharp mind. After learning English quickly, he worked at a variety of jobs for the next few years. In 1907, Ponzi left the United States for Montreal, Canada, and secured a job as an assistant teller at the newly established Banco Zarasi. Ponzi's impressive language skills in English, Italian, and French contributed to his successful application at the bank. While working at the bank, Ponzi was introduced to the concept of fraud. The bank's modus operandi was to take money from one customer and distribute it to another, creating a cycle of debts. The bank's owner paid a high interest rate of 6% on deposits, which was double the prevailing rate at the time, and the bank's growth reflected this. Eventually, Ponzi was promoted to bank manager, but he discovered that the bank was in dire financial straits due to bad loans in real estate. Additionally, the bank's owner was funding interest payments not from profits on investments, but by using funds deposited in newly opened accounts. The bank eventually collapsed, and Zarasi fled to Mexico with a substantial portion of the bank's funds. Ponzi was arrested on charges of fraud and forgery and served three years in prison. Ponzi decided to return to the U.S. in 1911, but he got involved in a scheme to smuggle Italian illegal immigrants across the border. He was caught and spent two years in prison again. After his release, he made his way back to Boston, where he had many jobs, before deciding to scam on a large scale. Later, Ponzi set up a small office at 27 School Street in Boston in 1919. He received a letter from a company in Spain asking about the advertising catalog, which included an international reply coupon IRC, leading Ponzi to find a weakness in the system, which gave him an opportunity to make money. These postal reply coupons allowed a person in one country to pay for the postage of a reply to a correspondent in another country. IRCs were priced at the cost of postage in the country of purchase, but could be exchanged for stamps to cover the cost of postage in the country where redeemed. If these values were different, there was a potential profit. Inflation after World War I had greatly decreased the cost of postage in Italy expressed in US dollars so that an IRC could be bought cheaply in Italy and exchanged for US stamps of higher value, which could then be sold. Ponzi claimed that the net profit on these transactions, after expenses and exchange rates, was in excess of 400%. Seeing an opportunity, Ponzi quit his job as a translator to set his IRC scheme in motion but needed a large capital outlay to buy IRCs at lower performing European currencies. He first tried to borrow money from several banks, but no success. In January 1920, Ponzi started his own company, the Securities Exchange Company, to promote the scheme. In the first month, 18 people invested in his company with a total of $1,800. He paid them promptly, the very next month, with the money obtained from the newer set of investors. In the bustling city of Boston, Charles Ponzi was a man on a mission. He had already made a name for himself as a scam artist, but he wasn't content with just a small-time con. He wanted to make it big, and he had a plan. Ponzi's idea was simple yet devious. He would promise investors huge returns on their investments by taking advantage of the differences in currency exchange rates. He claimed that he could buy international postal reply coupons in Europe and redeem them for a profit in the United States. It was a clever scheme, and it appealed to many people who were looking for a way to make quick and easy money. Ponzi set up his first office in a small room on the second floor of a building in Boston. He managed to convince a few people to invest, and the returns were impressive. Word quickly spread, and more and more people came to invest in Ponzi's scheme. 
with the help of his persuasive salesmanship, he was able to increase the amount invested from $5,000 to $25,000 in just a few months. Ponzi's success attracted the attention of the media, and he became something of a celebrity. He hired agents to seek out new investors, and the scheme began to grow rapidly. People were being paid impressive rates of return, which encouraged even more investors to join. Ponzi's operation soon became too big for his small office, so he rented a larger space in the prestigious Niles building on School Street. The investments kept pouring in, and Ponzi's profits continued to grow. By May 1920, he had made $420,000, and by June, people had invested $2.5 million in his scheme. By July, he was raking in a million dollars per week. Ponzi began depositing the money in the Hanover Trust Bank of Boston, hoping that once his account was large enough, he could impose his will on the bank or even become its president. He bought a controlling interest in the bank through himself and several friends after depositing $3 million. Ponzi's company had set up branches from Maine to New Jersey, and people were mortgaging their homes and investing their life savings. Despite the huge amounts of money coming in, Ponzi's scheme was running at a loss. He was not generating legitimate profits, and the only way he could continue providing returns to existing investors was by using new investors' money. But most of his investors did not take their profits, they reinvested in the scheme, hoping for even bigger returns. Although Ponzi's scheme was one of the most notorious scams in history, it continues to be a cautionary tale. It shows the dangers of greed and the importance of due diligence when it comes to investing. As the scheme continued to grow, Ponzi's legal troubles began to mount. In July 1920, the Boston Post ran a front-page story alleging that Ponzi was making false claims about his investments. The paper sent an investigative reporter to Europe to investigate, and the reporter found no evidence of Ponzi's supposed postal coupon arbitrage. In response, Ponzi called a press conference to defend himself, but his explanations were vague and unsatisfactory. The Massachusetts Securities Division launched an investigation into Ponzi's business, and on August 11, 1920, Ponzi was arrested and charged with mail fraud. His assets were frozen, and the business was shut down. Ponzi was released on bail, but he was soon rearrested on state charges of larceny and violation of securities laws. Ponzi's trial began in October 1920, and he was found guilty on all counts. He was sentenced to five years in prison, and he served three and a half years before being deported to Italy in 1924. Ponzi's scheme had collapsed, and his investors lost everything. Some lost their life savings, while others were forced to sell their homes and possessions. The total losses were estimated to be between $7 million and $20 million, equivalent to $100 million to $290 million in 2021. Ponzi's legacy lives on, as his name has become synonymous with financial fraud schemes. The Ponzi scheme has been replicated countless times since then, and it remains one of the most common types of financial fraud. However, few have been able to match Ponzi's success, and his scheme remains one of the largest in history. However, Ponzi's plans were dashed when on August 11, 1920, he was arrested on charges of mail fraud. He was released on bail, but more charges were soon brought against him. On November 1, 1920, he was found guilty of 86 counts of mail fraud and sentenced to five years in federal prison. He appealed the decision but was ultimately sentenced to an additional seven to nine years in state prison. Ponzi was released from prison in 1924 and immediately deported to Italy, his country of birth. He continued to try his hand at various schemes but was mostly unsuccessful. He returned to the United States in 1934 and was arrested again on charges of mail fraud. He served an additional two years in prison and was again deported to Italy. Ponzi died in poverty in Brazil in 1949, largely forgotten by the financial world he had once captivated. His name, however, has become synonymous with the type of scheme he created, and his legacy serves as a cautionary tale for those looking to make a quick buck through fraudulent means. The story of Charles Ponzi and his infamous Ponzi scheme is a cautionary tale of greed and deceit. 
Ponzi scheme promised investors high returns on their investments by using a method he claimed was based on buying and selling international postal reply coupons. In reality, Ponzi was using the money from new investors to pay off older ones, with little to no actual investment taking place. As 